Lillian and Maurice Berard did not live a life that many would consider normal. The French mountaineering pair seemed destined to be together ever since they met while climbing in South America. It was the perfect match, as both individuals loved traveling and climbing high altitude peaks. They climbed primarily by using alpine style, moving quickly without much gear, and would be known to focus their interests mainly on the peaks in the Himalayan and Karakoram ranges. Anyone who is familiar with mountains understands that these two ranges are the pinnacle for all high altitude climbers. With the highest peak being Everest, located in the Himalayas, and the second highest peak being K2, located on the Karakorams. Today, we will focus on the latter just mentioned, the Karakoram Range, but more specifically, the Savage Mountain, K2. In 1986, Lillian and Maurice Berard would scrap together just enough finances and travel to K2. This is their story. Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel where we cover all tragic and terror stories. So if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Plus ring the notification bell to be notified of all new uploads. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. K2. It is said to be so mystical to climbers that once one sets their eyes on its beauty, they won't be able to forget her. That the mountain can be so mesmerizing, almost like calling to climbers. Or at least, that's what they say. But it's hard to deny the marvel, intimidation, or even the intrigue that such a majestic sight is said to behold. Standing at 28,251 feet, the second highest peak known to man is a deadly challenge. K2 has been classified as a much harder and riskier climb than that of its counterpart Everest. This can mainly be credited to the harsh weather conditions that K2 can experience. Avalanches are more common, conditions are not suitable for long-term life, and there are hidden traps laying underneath one's feet. The thrill of achieving a summit on such a beast is very high, but so is the risk. But to the mountaineering couple, deemed the world's highest couple, this thrill was exactly what the pair seeked. And in 1982, they would summit Gasher Broom 2. In 1984, the couple would ascend Nanga Parbat, with Lillianne being the first female ascent of this peak, as well as attempting a summit on Makalu, but narrowly missing the peak due to bad weather. They would accomplish all of this in preparation for the hardest climb of their lives, K2. The Berard's love for mountaineering only grew over the years as did their experience, and in June of 1986, they would gather enough funds to coordinate a summit attempt of K2. Their attempt would not be alone, as they put together a small team consisting of Polish climber Wanda Rutkiewicz and French climber Michael Parmenter. Over the years, Wanda Rutkiewicz would be considered one of the most accomplished early female alpinists to ever live. She was very excited to partner up with the Berards, as the respect was mutual between the two. Ironically, the Berards' first challenge that they would experience in their trip to K2 wouldn't even be at the start of the mountain, but actually in the cab ride leading up to their trip. Whether it would be excitement or carelessness, Maurice and Lillian had left their passports plane tickets and the entire funds for the expedition in the backseat of a taxi. A nuisance to anyone that was about to take on the hardest challenge of their lives. But instead, they had to worry about losing a couple of dollars. The situation was quickly resolved once they noticed their mistake and were on their way. Eventually, they would meet up with Wanda and Michael in a motel that caters to K2 mountain climbers. Because of the timing of their attempt, they weren't the only ones preparing for the summit. And among this group would be Alan Rouse, the first British mountaineer that would summit K2. It would be from this location that the team would head to the base camp and begin their expedition. The team of four would begin their summit attempt on June 18th, 1986. Overall, the expedition started off as almost all due, smoothly and without any hiccups. The team had thoroughly discussed their plan the day before, and they were all aware of the route they were going to take. They were going to attempt the most common summit route up K2, the Abruzzi Spur. They would not bring supplemental oxygen, as their goal was to be lightweight and quick. However, their attempt would be the first of the season, which would provide additional challenges to the group. 
there would be no camp set up ahead of them to assist as needed. And additionally, all paths would be drowned in snow, leaving no clear areas to step and no established ropes to assist the climbers. Essentially, they were creating the path for the climbers behind them to follow up the mountain. All four would spend their first night at the 6,300 meter mark. Their progress was slow, but steady throughout their attempt. And the second night, they would reach the 7,100 meter mark and rest there, followed by the third day at the 7,700 meter mark, and the fourth day at the 7,900 meter mark. The fourth day, the progress is slow as the weather had worsened, and both women at this point were struggling to continue. Maurice was visibly exhausted as the tolls of the Savage Mountain weighed on the group, and Michael, the only one of the group that seemed to be in a stable mind, became more and more concerned with the safety of everyone, as it was clear their progress was not what they had hoped for. That night, there would be a discussion on whether the team should continue. Eventually, they all agreed to attempt the summit tomorrow. Despite their physical and mental exhaustion, not one member of the team had made it this far by quitting. However, the next day would not be any easier. The Berards, Wanda and Michael, would only make it to the 8,300 meter mark, only about 300 meters away from the summit. The night would be so cold that they would have to pitch one tent and all huddle together inside conserving as much heat as possible. Overall, the mood of the camp was not positive as each member had to remind each other of why they were there to begin with. And according to Michael, this night was the worst of their ascent as each member of the group was struggling to feel healthy or even happy. Because the group's progress was slower than expected, they had not prepared for a long trek and their supplies were depleting extremely fast. And most importantly, they were running out of fuel for their miniature stove, a key tool for Alpinists in the 1980s as this was their source of water. The snow can be taken and melted down to drink, and therefore not having enough fuel can be life-threatening in bad conditions. The next morning, June 23rd, all four members arose from the tent, having barely slept the night before, and began their trek to the summit. The terrain was absolutely brutal. Jagged rocks lay hidden underneath feet of snow, and they stood on the slope just under the summit, looking at the task in front of them. The trail lay behind them where other climbers would follow, but their work wasn't done. Wanda today felt better than the previous night, and most of that can be credited to the excitement of a K2 summit. She would be the first of the group to reach the top, marking her as the first woman to summit K2. 45 minutes later, the Berards and Michael would reach the summit as well, making Lillian only the second woman to ever summit K2. A historical moment for both of them as they wrote their names in the history book. The weather could not have been more perfect that day and there was no wind and the skies were clear providing a beautiful view of the landscape. The mountain had finally rewarded them for their persistence and Michael would later say, I felt like I was on the beach because the weather was so nice. Just as the group had climbed up, they must now climb down. However, the Berard's health seemed to be worse than the day before, so much to the point that they were slowing down Wanda and Michael, and just as quickly as they had summited, they returned to the 8,300 meter mark where the Berards began setting up camp for the night. Wanda could hardly believe what they were doing. She knew the team needed to get off the mountain. An unspoken rule in the mountaineering community at that time was that after you reach the summit, you descend like your life depends on it. This was to avoid all potential risks not just with the mountain, but one's own bodily health. But despite their efforts to convince them, they set up camp and settled in for the night. They had just used their last bit of stove fuel, leaving nothing left. Michael and Wanda were both terrified at this point and feared for their lives. So much so that Wanda resorted to taking sleeping pills just to take her mind off the situation. They did not agree with the decision-making of the Berards, but were unable to oppose it. They wanted to move and fast. Nobody slept much all night. The team packed up on the morning of July 24th and continued their descent. Michael would lead, followed by Wanda, and then the Berards. Because they had no fuel, it was discussed that they needed to keep moving until they reached camp or other climbers that had supplies before settling in for the night. And each individual was feeling the harsh effects of a prolonged stay on the mountain and began to focus solely on their own survival. Wanda would later state, I was the only one who could help myself at this altitude. 
The weather began to turn for the worse as their time was running out. Snow began to fall and winds could be heard howling to the sky and visibility worsened by the hour. Michael made steady work off the mountain, creating a footpath to follow so it was easier for the team. But the Berards were slow, really slow, and Wanda lagged behind with them for a while, but eventually would catch up to Michael. Turning round, Michael and Wanda could see the Berards' silhouettes in the distance. They were not left with many options as they watched the small black figures move against the bright snow. They could not slow down. Wanda and Michael managed to make it to camp, 7,700 meters, where they were greeted by an Italian expedition. In terrible shape, they both warmed their bodies as they replenished their strength. The fierce wind was brutal when combined with the snowfall, and visibility continued to get worse as time went on. All they could do was pray that the Berards would arrive at camp in a few hours. But when they failed to make it to camp, there was little that could be done. Little hope was kept as the mood at the camp began to turn sour, and eventually the morning had passed, and it was time to move on. Conditions were increasingly difficult to manage as a decision had to be made, to stay and wait, or to descend. At this point, Michael was hoping somehow that the Berards would make it, but others in the camp were not as optimistic, and ultimately Michael would stay and wait while the Italians and Wanda descended to escape the conditions. They left behind a small radio for Michael to use as a last resort, and with one final word of encouragement, they left camp, desperate to get off the mountain. As Wanda and the Italian climbers descended, things did not get any easier, and there were small makeshift camps along the way left by other climbers, but ultimately, their destination would be base camp. Wanda and company managed to make it to the 7,000 meter camp where they would wait for Michael and the Berards. However, Wanda began experiencing the early stages of frostbite in her fingers and toes, which would become a deadly problem if it developed further. They made the decision to continue their descent. Dark clouds began to obscure the sky as the snowfall became heavier and heavier, a bad omen for Michael as they knew he was higher up on the mountain. Eventually, Wanda would make it back safely to base camp, and they began treatment on her as she settled in, relieved to be off the mountain. She was exhausted, and her frostbite had developed to the point where she was unable to do simple tasks. But her attitude surprised some, as she was cheerful and couldn't stop smiling. Her companion's whereabouts were still unknown, but understandably, she couldn't be more relieved. Back at the 7,700 meter camp, and a few hours after Wanda had left, Michael faced an impossible decision. The weather was making his stomach turn over, as the clouds did not look inviting. Snow had already begun falling for some time, and the Berards had not made it to camp. Eventually, he made the difficult decision to continue the descent. Michael made fantastic pace, as he was practically running down the mountain. There was a great incentive to move fast as visibility was getting worse and worse due to the snowfall and it felt as though the dark clouds looming over him were waiting for a slip up. As he got closer and closer to base camp, conditions turned to a whiteout. Combined with gale force winds, Michael was only able to see a few feet in front of him and it would not take much to trigger an avalanche in these conditions, something that K2 was famous for. He descended for hours each step praying that there was firm snow underneath. It would be very easy for Michael to make one fatal move off the path and into darkness. Visibility had gotten so bad that around the 3,000 meter mark, Michael was unable to continue on his own for fear of stepping off route. Luckily, the radio that was left behind came in handy as he used it to call for help. And with the help of directions from base camp and a few landmarks he had stumbled upon, Michael was able to navigate his way through the remaining descent tired, hungry, and cold, he stumbled his way to safety. As members of base camp rushed to his aid, he only managed to mutter out two words, and Wanda. Both Wanda and Michael would survive the ordeal, but the Berards were not so lucky. The most likely scenario is that they were caught in the storm, fell off path, and collapsed from exhaustion. It is not known why the Berards were so slow to descend. Michael and Wanda would both later admit that they were too caught up in their own thoughts to pay much attention to help. Lillian's body was found a month later by a South Korean team in a snowfield at the 5,330 meter mark. Maurice, 
would not be found until 1998, 12 years after the ordeal on a glacier above base camp. Both are now buried at the Gilkey Memorial. Lillian and Maurice were lovers that died following their passion together. Two of the few victims that K2 has claimed. This story serves as a reminder to all those that dare attempt to summit the Savage Mountain. <laughs>